Good afternoon and welcome to the Immune Deficiency Foundation's Skid Compass Lunch and Learn. Today's program will explore supporting siblings of children with chronic illness. My name is Emma Mertens and I'm the Program Manager of Community Relations at IDF. On behalf of all of us here at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this Lunch and Learn. We are excited to host this webinar for the IDF community. IDF is dedicated to fostering a community empowered by education. We want you to remember that IDF is committed to our community, serving you as a trusted resource through the use of technology and innovation. We are here to give you the tools and information to become empowered and offer you our compassion, understanding, and support to emphasize that you are not alone on your journey. Today's Lunch and Learn is part of IDF's regular series of bite-sized programming that will provide diagnosis-specific information and support to our community wherever they may be. A brief disclaimer. Please remember, the information presented during this forum is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We are here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during an educational forum or event. Many of you tuning in today are doing so because you are an individual, parent, caregiver, or friend to someone living with severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID. SCID Compass, an educational program of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, is designed to guide parents of infants diagnosed with SCID, people living with SCID, and the medical community through the journey of learning about this rare, life-threatening medical disorder and find support to navigate the health challenges along the way. Skid Compass is supported by a grant through the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, which is an agency of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Skid Compass was developed through a partnership between the Immune Deficiency Foundation, RTI International, and the Association of Public Health Laboratories with support from Expecting Health and the Skid Angels for Life Foundation. To learn about SCID and SCID Compass, please visit our website at www.skidcompass.org. The website offers a robust variety of online and principal resources for anyone eager to learn more about this condition or share information with others. Topics cover every step in a family SCID journey from diagnosis to return home and everything in between. Our website is also available in Spanish, French, and German by clicking on select a language in the upper navigation. Skid Compass also offers monthly and annual programming and events. In addition to our monthly lunch and learns, we host an annual Skid Summit and support all the great programming that IDF offers the PI community. This includes forums, Ask IDF, Get Connected groups, and Rare of the Rare. We're also always thinking of ways to bring the latest in Skid to you, such as the Skid Compass Summit. We hope you'll save the date for this exciting annual event later in the spring, June 23rd to 24th. I would now like to introduce our guest for today. Samantha Childs is a certified child life specialist with years of experience in numerous clinical settings, including acute care, trauma, sibling support, rehabilitation and ambulatory centers. She specializes in grief and loss, traumatic injury, and sibling support using a strengths-based approach to help children and families reach their greatest healing potential. Samantha provides services to children and families in the Baltimore metro area through her private practice, Kids Coat Baltimore, and is the consulting certified child life specialist for several Maryland health organizations. Welcome, Sam. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. All right, so as Emma said, my name is Sam. I am a child life specialist, um, currently in private practice. I was really excited when I was approached to do this um, Lunch and Learn because it's uh, a topic that I think is so important and sometimes overlooked. Um, and it's something that I've taken a really uh, great professional interest in, but I also, um, have a personal interest in as well. I am actually a sibling myself. Um, I have a younger sister who has a few different chronic illnesses and she was diagnosed at a really young age. So I'm hoping that I can give you a really well-rounded um, perspective on 
you know, what it's like to be a sibling of someone who has a chronic illness and some ways that you can support them um, moving forward. So just some context before we really get into it about what a child life specialist is, um, unless you're, you know, in and out of a pediatric hospital or work within a pediatric hospital, it's pretty unlikely that you've run into one of us or worked closely with a child life specialist. Um, so we have educational and clinical training in child development and family functioning, specifically in the context of illness, injury, and loss, and how that impacts a child and the family system um, over time. So we use several different therapeutic modalities. Um, most we use um, developmentally appropriate education. Um, we use a lot of play to figure out, you know, what a child is feeling and help them to express themselves. Um, and then other emotional ex expression techni techniques to help children and families process their experiences and cope with trauma and difficult life events and transitions. So like I said, we most often work within pediatric um, hospital settings, though a lot of us are starting to branch out into alternative settings um, so that we can expand our reach into the community. So funeral homes and schools and private practice um, and settings like that. So as for me, I started my career as a child specialist about four years ago. I started uh, as an inpatient oncology specialist. And from there, I moved to multiple different locations across various different hospitals, large and small. Um, and I started noticing that there is a very large, significant gap in services. Once a child or a family is discharged from you know, the hospital or a clinical program back into the community, um, they lose a lot of supports that they had when they were in the hospital. So I really wanted to kind of fill in those gaps and meet some of those needs. So back in the fall of 2020, I started my private practice, Kids Cope Baltimore. Um, and that way I'm able to meet some of these psychosocial needs within the community and help kids, you know, process their diagnosis, work with siblings and families um, after diagnosis and beyond. So some of the goals that I want to hit on during this presentation are, um, I really wanna discuss the potential impacts of chronic illness on siblings across different developmental stages and ages. So we know that developmentally, there's different you know, stressors that arise with each age, depending on um, their understanding of their circumstances and that can lead to different behaviors and reactions. So it's important to look at it from that developmental standpoint and provide support in that way. I want to determine strategies to mitigate some of these negative impacts of illness on siblings um, and consider techniques to leverage some of the positive consequences of the sibling experience because there are positives as well. Um, and I want the caregiver community to feel more confident in understanding and supporting siblings um, and feel empowered to do so. And at the very end, I want to kind of open it up to everyone and provide a safe space for caregivers in the community to share questions um, some concerns and experiences with one another and kind of get support in that way. So when we're talking about the sibling experience, it's really important to start from the very beginning. So those very initial stages of diagnosis um, of, of really any chronic illness, but skid in particularly, um, just to get that full picture of what it's like to be a sibling and how their experience differs greatly from that of um, the child with SCID and the parents, you'll start to see that it's a very black and white difference between the experience that the caregivers have at diagnosis and the caregivers that the siblings have. And that can kind of set up the trajectory for um, how the sibling copes into the, the future. So talking about the care, caregiver experience, um, most of the time caregivers receive the diagnosis of SCID within the hospital or the clinic setting. Um, they're receiving a plethora of information, an overwhelming amount of information, really. Uh, they're hearing about resources and they're hearing about different supports that are designated for parents or adults. Um, they're able to be involved in coming up with this treatment plan that are provided with choices and they're hearing about, um, you know, the consequences of each choice and what that might look like for your child. Um, and most importantly, um, in, in most settings, there is access to a social worker to help with some of the log logistical um, components of receiving a new diagnosis. There is a chaplain and there's other supportive figures. Uh, meanwhile, the sibling is at home and they're receiving this information secondhand. So they're not receiving it directly from the source. They're receiving it most often from parents uh, who are still processing their own feelings and understanding of the diagnosis. So a lot of times 
um, it's shaded with some of the emotion um, that the parent feels. So they're receiving kind of this information that's um, a little biased with emotion. Uh, there's that physical distance component. They're at home um, when parents are away receiving this diagnosis. This can lead to them creating misconceptions about what's going on in the hospital, where the caregivers are, where the baby is. Um, and a lot of times, especially with the younger kids, imaginations run wild. Um, they're trying to fill in the gaps of the information that they have versus what they don't really understand. And oftentimes that can be a lot scarier than what's really happening. And then the baby comes home. And this is a really significant life transition for any sibling, whether it's a healthy baby or a baby who has a complex need. Routines are shifting tremendously. There is an increase in responsibilities and pressures. Um, caregivers are very likely acting differently, um, especially with SCID, they're more than likely more cautious than before, um, protective of the baby. They might be limiting contact of the baby and you know, neighbors or other uh, family members that might've been in and out more often before the baby was born. Um, and maybe even limiting contact of the baby and sibling. And then there's of course that separation from the caregivers and from the baby during hospitalizations, during doctor visits. And like I mentioned before, this can be really anxiety provoking and confusing for a sibling. And then in addition to spending more time with the baby uh, physically, caregivers are often spending more time on tasks that are related to the baby. So um, calling up doctors, making doctor's appointments, um, looking for second opinions, uh, contacting insurance, um, all those things are uh, tasks that are, you know, in the eyes of a sibling taking away attention from them and um, back onto the baby. And at this point, it's uh, really the point that reality is setting in for the sibling that this might be our new normal and uh, previous family patterns and things we used to do might not return. So this is a really pivotal time for the family and sibling. Uh, this is the start of, you know, the siblings having a very different experience than the caregivers and the patient. Um, it can be a really isolating experience. It can be frustrating. It can be scary. Um, and this is where the foundation is developing for the sibling's trajectory. Um, this is, you know, where coping mechanisms are starting to form um, and they can either adjust in a positive way or a more negative way. So it's really important that support and intervention um, is started as soon as possible. And I think in thinking of you know, interventions and support for siblings, it's really important to bring up this concept of siblings as a type of shadow patient or having received um, a shadow diagnosis. Um, it kind of helps to frame it as a way that it's not something that only the patient or the, the parents are feeling, but it's something that um, the sibling is feeling and experiencing in a real, in a very real way, um, no more or less than the patients or the parents, um, and they very much feel its impacts. Um, and it's, it's important that caregivers are able to manage the stress and the responsibility of caring for their sick child, um, while also kind of supporting the emotional well-being of siblings and other children in the family. So that's a really difficult um, task, and that's really, you know, stressful. And um, I think it's, it's important to think about some of these developmental considerations that we're going to be talking about further in the coming slides to kind of uh, help support you to do that. Um, and that will be a helpful foundation for, you know, predicting uh, your children's experience and what they might be feeling or thinking um, and understanding exactly what they're going, going through. So the psychosocial impacts on the siblings. What exactly are we talking about when we say there's you know, negative impacts on siblings? Uh, so there's been a lot of research into the uh, reactions and behaviors and experiences of siblings, uh, especially related to the oncology population. So there's been a lot of research done on siblings who have um, a sibling who has a cancer diagnosis. And of course, SCID is not cancer, um, but there's a lot of similarities in the way that it can present um, and impact the family dynamic. So there's this initial diagnosis that's often uh, surprising and unexpected. There's um, a lot of time, a, a treatment period that can be pretty intense. Um, and then there's the lifelong impacts of having SCID and living um, with a child who has SCID. So it's um, 
easy to kind of extrapolate some of those things that we've seen in research and data in the oncology community and kind of apply those things to um, siblings in the skin community. So 57% of siblings report impaired emotional quality of life. So that can be um, more rates of depression, anxiety, tearfulness, 40% report difficulties with memory, learning, and concentration. And that can also lead to some declines in school performance. Um, so forgetting homework when they used to not uh, forget their homework or having lower scores on tests. And then there's the feelings of guilt and anger and jealousy towards their siblings. So like I was saying before, it's really important to consider um, development when thinking about supporting your uh, sibling, your child. Um, there's different experiences and stressors for siblings of different ages and stressors and impacts will shift as a sibling gets older. So if the sibling is a toddler at the time of diagnosis, they'll have certain concerns and responses. And then as they move into school age and adolescence, um, they will have different concerns and different responses. Um, so we'll discuss some of those typical and uh, normative responses, things that we've seen come uh, as patterns across different populations of siblings. Um, but it's important to remember that every child is different and uh, these may not be how your child is responding and that's okay too. So we're gonna start with infant siblings. So it's uh, kind of a misconception a lot of the time that babies, they eat, sleep, cry. They don't really have too much of an idea of what's going on. But really, this is a really significant stage in a child's life and especially related to their development. Um, it's the time that they're kind of gaining a sense of trust in, the, in their world and a secure attachment to their caregivers. So a challenge for an infant sibling uh, would be that separation from caregivers. Um, they're looking to have that sense of security and they're having that sense of attachment to caregivers. And if um, parents are going back and forth to the hospital with the other child or um, there, there can be that, that separation and that kind of lack of secure attachment. Um, there's also a loss of routine. Um, and some responses that you might see from an infant are fussiness due to this in inconsistency, changes in eating or sleeping patterns. So a baby that had been sleeping through the night uh, prior to this diagnosis might you know, be waking up more, uh, sleeping during the day more, um, you know, requesting to crying to be fed more often. Um, all of those different things might be what you would see from an infant sibling. So some ways that you can help your infant would be to encourage consistent caregiving in all settings as much as possible. Um, so of course it's not always possible if you know mom and dad or caregivers parents are going to the hospital with the other child and there's you know a neighbor or another family member who's going to be watching the infant. Um, so even if the caregivers themselves are not necessarily consistent, making sure that the caregivers all stick to certain routines and schedules that are determined um, to keep that you know, sense of security and routine for the infant, which is very comforting for them. So making sure that their eating schedule stays at a you know, certain regimen and they go to sleep and they wake at the same time, uh, all those types of things are helpful. As for toddlers, uh, in this stage there, Expressive skills are increasing, though their understanding of the world and what's happening is still pretty limited. Um, this is the stage where there's a lot of stranger anxiety or stranger danger. That's when they're fearful, when caregivers and family aren't around um, and there's not familiar faces. So some common challenges for toddler siblings is again, that separation anxiety. Um, when parents are back and forth from the hospital and they're left with different caregivers, that can be really upsetting. Um, and then there's also the confusion about the baby and the caregiver's experiences, um, not quite understanding, you know, what the hospital is or um, what skid means. They hear a lot of things, um, adults talking, and they, they don't really have the ability to ask questions because that verbal communication isn't fully there yet. Um, so those are some challenges for, for toddler siblings. And some behaviors that you might expect to see are regression. So this can include loss of new skills. Um, a toddler that had been talking in full sentences might revert to speaking in one or two word sentences or babbling or crawling again. Um, you might see temper tantrums, aggression in the way that they play or you know, hitting their friends on the playground or throwing toys, all those types of things are um, expected from a toddler. 
Some ways that you can support your toddler would be to offer and repeat very simple explanations using concrete vocabulary. So what I mean by concrete vocabulary is, you know, something that is very simple and doesn't leave much to the imagination. So using simple words that they're familiar with, um, saying things like so-and-so is going to the hospital. The hospital is a place where there are doctors who can help so-and-so feel better. Um, and then repeating those explanations often. Um, that will really help it to set in for a toddler. They might be asking the same questions over and over again. It's really important to just repeat yourself um, using that concrete vocabulary. And then also something that's really important is to maintain limits on discipline as well as their routine and schedule. So maintaining those limits on discipline, uh, it's really important that can impact, you know, the child's behavior in years to come. It's important that they know that there are still expectations and limits and boundaries um, and kind of to stick to what you were going with before the diagnosis, um, just to keep things you know, consistent. It can be really easy sometimes if your toddler is crying just to uh, you know, give them a candy or give them what they're asking for, um, but that can lead to some more issues and problems with coping and behavior down the road. So it's important to maintain the discipline as much as possible. Preschoolers, they are starting to be really set in their routines. Um, so those routines that they've found comfort in as toddlers and as infants, they're really starting to understand their routines and they're objecting to any major changes. Um, they have increased imagination and magical thinking. Uh, and magical thinking is kind of something that happens when they don't have the full picture. So they're filling in these gaps with um, what they think is going on to kind of create a picture of what's going on. Um, Oftentimes it's inaccurate and it can be pretty scary too. They also have a very egocentric view of the world at this point. It's very me, 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 how is this going to affect me? Um, who's gonna feed me? Who's gonna pick me up from school? Um, who am I gonna stay with when you're at the hospital? Uh, everything is very focused on how things impact them. Another uh, a challenge for preschool siblings is separation from caregivers. So as you can see, that's a common theme uh, that's a challenge for really a child of any age, a sibling of any age. Um, they can't fully understand the sibling's diagnosis at that point. So like I said, with the magical thinking, they're making up their own details to fill in these gaps. Um, you might see that they're acting out, that they're clingy. They don't want you to leave, even if it's for short periods of time, like running errands. Um, and you might also see regression in this age group as well. So some ways that you can help a preschooler. Assure them that it's not their fault that the sibling is in the hospital or sick. Um, a lot of times with siblings, we see that they place blame on themselves. Um, it's that egocentric way of thinking that we discussed earlier. Um, what did I do to make this happen? A lot of siblings think, oh, I didn't want a sibling. And I thought that I wanted to stay an only child. And that's why my sibling was born sick. Um, so it's really important to assure them that it's not their fault and that it's not anyone's fault. Uh, it's also important to ask questions and kind of probe about their understanding so that you can see if there's any misconceptions and clear those up. Um, again, and by and clearing these misconceptions, use simple, concrete explanations. Um, encourage questions as much as possible. Always, you know, leave the door open for questions. You can ask, do you have any questions about so-and-so's um, illness? Do you have any questions about why they're sick? Um, and then... A really important part of supporting a preschooler is to play with them. And play is something that we as child life specialists use a lot as a tool to, you know, gain some insight into what a child is feeling, um, what they're thinking, what their, their experience is looking like. Uh, they don't have the verbal communication skills that adults do. They're not able to say, like, I'm feeling stressed or I'm feeling anxious or I'm mad that this is happening. So a lot of times you'll see patterns in their play that can kind of shed some light on what they're going through. Um, you might see that they're, you know, playing hospital a lot, or they're talking about their characters dying, or their characters are fighting each other, their dinosaurs are fighting. So you can kind of loop that into conversations in the future. Hey, I saw that your dinosaurs were fighting. What, what was that about? Um, kind of asking those gentle questions to uh, see what's going on. Then there's school age. So at this point, their uh, children are more able to understand the sequence of events and some cause and effect. They can talk through their problems verbally to solve them. And because of this, they have a better understanding of 
what's going on and what uh, a diagnosis of skid means and what it looks like for their family. And they might be feeling worried and scared for their sibling. Um, but in the same breath, they might be jealous of the special attention that they perceive their sibling to be getting from caregivers and from neighbors and from people in the community who are reaching out to help. They're able to kind of rationalize that they don't want skid and they don't want to be sick, but they're still feeling kind of that, that pull towards jealousy of that special attention. So some typical responses that you might see would be um, becoming withdrawn from family and friends. A kid who is normally really engaged during recess or during after school activities, they might um, choose to do something alone instead. Um, they might be clingy or uncooperative when they used to not be uncooperative. Um, they are having conflicting feelings about siblings and they might be verbalizing those or behaving in, in the ways that we just discussed to kind of show that that's how they're feeling. So to support your school age child, encourage them to ask questions and continue providing those concrete responses. Um, at this age, you can add a little bit more detail depending on you know, the questions that your school age is asking. They might be able to you know, understand, um, have a better understanding of some of these concepts. And it's really important to validate and acknowledge their feelings, even if those feelings are uncomfortable for you as a parent or a caregiver to hear. Um, if they say, uh, I hate my sibling, or um, I wish I was the one who was sick, that can be frustrating to hear as a parent. Um, but to just say, you know, I hear you, I understand that's what you're feeling. Um, I'm sorry you're feeling that way and go from there to support them. Also, including them in conversations about their sibling or any changes that are happening in, in treatment, um, if they're interested. And what I mean by that is, some school agers, uh, and you're the expert of your own child, so you'll know best, but some children cope in a more active or information seeking way. So they want to know all of the facts, all the information laid out for them, and that can help them cope better and feel more secure. And then there's the more avoiding copers who too much information worries them. So they just want to know, you know the basics of how this is going to affect me, what this is going to look like. Um, but too much information will kind of scare them. So you'll know what works best for your child and you can um, either include them in conversations or not based on this. And then there's adolescence. So those teenagers, they are, um, they have increased dependence on their peers and their social groups. So they're moving away from their main source of support uh, being the family to being their friends. They're working on establishing a personal identity and being autonomous and independent. They, um, so some common challenges for adolescents are they're often called upon to meet some of the increased caregiving demands that might be coming up because of this diagnosis of skid. So if there's younger children in the family, they might be babysitting them or picking them up from school or dropping them off at after school activities. Um, a lot of that responsibility might fall on them. And there's the loss of peer support. It's important to remember that having a sibling with a chronic uh, rare disease is a very unique experience. It's not something that all teens are going through. Um, so it can be hard for other teens to connect with your child who has, is having a very different experience than them, which can lead to a loss of support or even just a loss of perceived support from your teen. Um, also decreased opportunities for socialization because they have different responsibilities um, that they need to, to meet. So they might be feeling angry and frustrated uh, but you might also see them developing more adult-like coping mechanisms. Um, they might be really relying on music or going to the room with their door closed or um, kind of how adults cope and they have their different ways of coping. Um, that's kind of what we're seeing in teens at this point too. So to support your team, you can encourage peer activities and expression as much as possible, uh, respect their independence and their autonomy. Um, it's really, really important to kind of exhaust all of your other options for caregivers before relying on your adolescent child. Um, it's probably, you know, the easiest to have your teenager be the one who picks up kids from school, um, but that can lead to some resentment. And it's important that your teen knows that they are their own person and that you allow them to function independently as, as much as possible and that they're a sibling first and a caregiver second. Uh, also including them in conversations and family decision-making when appropriate. So 
teens have a lot of their own opinions and they want to share those. And it uh, helps with, you know, gaining a sense of autonomy and responsibility to be able to engage in those discussions with you. So we talked a lot about, you know, different developmental considerations and uh, how to help very specific age ranges and what their behaviors look like and all of that. Um, but there are some patterns that kind of can be used across the board for supporting siblings of any age. There's, it can be really boiled down to four specific keys. Um, and those are knowledge, communication, connection, and consistency. So knowledge, what I mean by that is helping siblings understand what's happening, providing them with the information to have the full picture. Uh, I included this picture of a puzzle because it really is like a puzzle. You're giving them the pieces to the puzzle so that they have the full picture and they have as best of an understanding as possible of what's going on and the diagnosis and what things look like for their family. Um, these, this information is really important because ideas that they piece together on their own to fill in the gaps can be scarier than reality. Um, it's important to use appropriate language when you're providing information, um, concrete language for those that the kiddos that are younger, and you can kind of expand and use some more abstract concepts when speaking with teens. Um, prepare them for any changes that are gonna be happening. Share that information with them. If there's gonna be a change in their schedule, someone different is gonna be picking them up from school on Tuesdays now. Um, there's going to be, you know, a change in their routine or their expectations. Keep them updated. Um, participation in medical discussions if appropriate and be open to questions. Even if you have to acknowledge that you might not have all the answers, just being open with um, sharing information and, and finding out information for your child will be really helpful. And by providing siblings with relevant knowledge and information, they'll be more empowered to ask questions and they'll feel more secure in their experience. And that can lead to improved coping and outcomes, um, especially down the road. And I think it's important to note, um, a lot of caregivers have the instinct to kind of protect siblings from potentially scary information or, you know, these adult concepts. And of course the intent is that you're, you know, protecting them from something that could scare them, but really that could have the opposite effect and can lead to distrust them not, you know, trusting that you're giving them the full picture. Um, it can cause them to come up with scary, um, you know, magical thinking and it, which is scarier than the actual reality of things. Um, so it's important to remember that giving information is, is helpful and beneficial and gives a sense of security um, and to kind of avoid that instinct of protecting the child from scary information. Then there's communication. So listen and talk to your child about their siblings diagnosis and treatment often um, as much as possible. Um, for older kids, this might include scheduling times to talk uh, because a lot of times it doesn't really come up naturally, but it's still important to have, you know, the conversation about what's going on and to stay posted and, you know, how they're feeling about things. Um, and for younger kids, this could be engaging them in play. That can be how you communicate with, you know, preschoolers and toddlers to see how they're feeling about things. Um, if you're away at the hospital for a long time or away from siblings um, or your other children for long periods, make sure that you make time for consistent phone or video calls just so they know they'll talk to their, their parent or their caregiver at least once a day. Um, and they can come to, to expect that and feel comforted by that. No, um, ensure that your child knows that you're available to listen. Um, and I think the biggest part of communication uh, is sharing your own feelings, communicating your own feelings, um, telling your child when you're feeling sad or when you're feeling angry, that shows that it's okay to feel that way. And that will help um, promote them to express those emotions as well. And then beyond communication um, is connection. And I mean, physical connection, emotional connection, uh, those are really, really important to maintain while you're supporting your, um, your child who's a sibling. Stay connected to them, um, bring family pictures to and from the hospital, send cards or notes so that they know that you're thinking of them even when you're far away, uh, sharing updates about things that are meaningful to your child, sharing videos. Um, and then when you are home, spending very intentional one-on-one -on -one time together. Uh, it's difficult during COVID times when there's limits on who's uh, available to, who's able to 
um, visit a sibling in the hospital or join in doctor's appointments. But post COVID, uh, encourage the sibling to come to appointments when able and appropriate. This helps them to feel uh, included in the experience and kind of gives them an idea of what's going on. And arrange for daily contact with either yourself or another trusted familiar adult. Um, so even if you're not able to connect with your child um, physically through touch every day, uh, having another person who can kind of be a stand-in um, and be that that's source of connection and um, comfort for your kid is really important. And then also allow time with uh, friends, that peer connection is important as well. One of the biggest keys, um, something that can really promote coping and security and a sense of comfort for kids is consistency. Um, it's difficult, especially with a chronic illness when things are already, always up in the air, um, but promoting that consistency whenever and wherever possible is really, really important. Um, sticking to regular routines helps to promote a sense of normalcy and helps kids know what to expect, which is really comforting for kids. And they really like to stick to that schedule. So that could be having consistent bedtimes, uh, staying in the same bed each night, mealtime routines, having dinner at the same time in the same spot, um, going to school as much as possible, um, extracurricular activities, and maintaining those family rules and discipline. And it's important to remember to stay patient with your child at this point. Um, the whole family is kind of adapting to new routines and it's going to take a little bit for, um, for everyone to get on board with things. Um, so being patient is important. All right, so like I said, there are positive consequences of sibling illness. Um, it's not all negative. Uh, it's having a child with a chronic illness isn't necessarily what families hope or plan for, um, but it can definitely lend itself to some unique positive outcomes. Um, and those include increased maturity and responsibility, feelings of independence, personal growth, and a sense of meaning, um, and then increased empathy, compassion, and thoughtfulness when compared to their like aged peers. In leveraging these positives, it's really, really important to um, understand that these positives don't occur without intention. Um, there is a difference from between children forming these traits organically uh, versus them being forced upon by caregivers or caregiver driven. If, feeling, if siblings are feeling empowered and supported by their parents and their caregivers, if they're feeling autonomous, there is greater chances of them developing those positive feelings for their siblings, being well adjusted, coping well, and experiencing some of these positive outcomes like increased maturity, taking responsibility. Um, meanwhile, if siblings are feeling pushed by caregivers to assume greater responsibility, or they perceive that their feelings um, are being overlooked or misunderstood, then resentment and uh, resentment will build and decreased coping and adjustment will form instead of these positive outcomes. So some do's and don'ts for how we can leverage these. Some do's are to provide your child with honest, developmentally appropriate information, thinking of the puzzle, giving them all of the pieces of the puzzle so that they have the full picture and they feel secure in their experience, um, which helps their ability to cope. Encourage the sharing of feelings. That includes uh, a caregiver sharing their feelings as well. Prioritize those four keys that we talked about, knowledge, communication, connection, and consistency. Give your child space to be independent and autonomous. Allow them to be their own person, separate from their sibling. Um, and then some don'ts, some things to try to avoid are shutting down discussion of feelings surrounding a sibling or the diagnosis. Um, so saying things like, oh, I don't feel like talking about that right now. Uh, no sad things right now. Don't, uh, th those types of things we don't um, can, can really lead to resentment instead. Another thing that's important to avoid is reframing the child's experience for them. So some examples of that would be saying, you shouldn't feel that way, or at least X, Y, Z, or you should want to help your sibling. Uh, those are all ways that parents sometimes try to reframe the child's experience for them. Uh, and it's not the most helpful approach. So I kind of think about it as if you're having a really hard day at work and you say to a coworker, oh, I'm just having the worst time today. Uh, just a really hard day, and they say something like, well, at least you have a job, or at least you woke up, um, 
not really helpful. It doesn't feel great. Um, and that's kind of how a kid feels too. Um, it's also important to not place unrealistic expectations on older children, especially related to helping with caregiving responsibilities. Um, so really trying to exhaust all of those other options first, try to use a neighbor, another family member, someone else in the community um, to meet those caregiving needs before you rely on your, your teen or adolescent child. All right, so wrapping it up, kind of going over everything we talked about, a quick summary. The earlier caregivers understand and recognize the impact of a child's chronic illness on a sibling and a family structure, the earlier they can implement supports for siblings and the better psychosocial outcomes will be. So early intervention is really key and has a significant impact on the trajectory of uh, siblings moving forward. Focus on providing knowledge, facilitating meaningful communication, forging that strong connection and maintaining consistency. Utilize those developmental considerations that we discussed as kind of a foundation for predicting and understanding what your child is going through. Um, and then that there are those positive implications of having a sibling with chronic illness and those can be leveraged with very intentional support. So at this point, I want to kind of open the stage to all of you guys um, for questions. I want um, you guys to be able to connect with each other, other caregivers in the community to kind of talk about your own experiences and tips and tricks that I've worked with um, your children and, and their sibling experience. Um, so go ahead and I will open it up to you guys. Okay, I see some of these questions. All right, someone asked, you talked a lot about playing with my toddler school age kid to figure out what they're thinking about their sibling's diagnosis. How do I begin that conversation? Any specific toys or activities you recommend to spark the conversation? That's a really good one. Um, so imaginative play and pretend play is really good at sparking conversations um, about what's going on in real life. So, you know, whether that's playing dollhouse or kitchen or whatever that is, things that, you know, the child is seeing in real life, um, being able to mimic those can kind of spur a conversation about what's going on. Um, playing with dolls or with dinosaurs um, and just really letting the child lead the conversation and the play. Um, I think that is really important. Um, and you can also add in prompts too, if you feel like it's not really getting anywhere. Um, you can say, oh, does your character have a sibling? Or, oh, where is their brother or sister? And kind of see if things um, progress that way. All right, what if my teen asks a big question that I'm not sure I have an answer to or don't know how as a parent feel about it yet? Questions about their sibling's future or treatment options. Teens are so smart, but sometimes they don't have the answers. That is really important to remember. Um, you're not supposed to have all the answers. Uh, and it's important that your child knows that, that you can be vulnerable with them and share. Um, you know, I don't have the, the answer to that question. I don't know what the future looks like. Um, and kind of helping them be comfortable in that space of unknown, um, which can be really hard. Um, but a lot of times we don't have answers um, to, you know, what's my sibling going to be like when they grow up? Or are they going to have to go to the hospital all the time? We don't, we don't really know. This is all stuff that, you know, we kind of deal with it as it comes up. Um, so I think it's important that you're honest with them about that. And then if there are questions that they have that you don't know, but you think someone might have the answer, um, communicating with whoever that is. If there is um, a doctor that you could ask, hey, my team has a really good question about this. I'm not sure how to answer it. What, what would you say? Um, or talking to a social worker or a child life specialist if you have access to one. Um, they can kind of help you navigate that as well. All right, let's see. How do I know when my older child might need more support beyond child life services such as therapy? That's a really good question. So when behaviors kind of go beyond what's normative and expected, that's when I would say it's probably time to add in some additional supports, such as a mental health therapist or a psychologist or psychiatrist. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's good to have some of those developmental considerations in mind. 
um, kind of, you know, we have, there, there are patterns that come up in siblings um, that we kind of, you know, come to expect those behaviors um, and we can support those. But if they kind of start impacting, you know, their daily life and um, they're not doing well at school, they're not doing well with friends, um, and it's, it's really a, a huge burden, I think that would be time to um, kind of approach a mental health therapist instead. All right, are child life services automatic in a hospital or outpatient clinic setting, or do I need to ask someone for a child life specialist to come and see us? That's a great question, and it really depends on the setting that you're in. Um, a lot of times in pediatric hospitals, inpatient, there are designated child life specialists to that unit, and they will likely check in with you, introduce themselves, and keep you on their radar if there is, you know, um, the treatment coming up or anything that they can support or help with. Um, sometimes in the outpatient clinic, there is, uh, you know, kind of a, a gap in who is available. There might be, you know, two child life specialists for an entire outpatient building um, who are serving a bunch of different clinics. So you might not run into one, but you can always ask if there's someone who's present and available. Um, ask your doctor ahead of time, even email them, hey, is there a child life specialist? Um, that works within this clinic? Is there a way that you could reach out to them and make sure that they're there for our visit? Um, it would be wonderful if one day down the line there are enough specialists to meet all of these needs, but there are definitely ways that you can um, plan ahead of time to ask if there is someone who will be available. Um, you said you were in private practice. How can I find a private practice child specialist near me? Are there a lot of you out there? Uh, unfortunately, there's not too many of us out there right now, although we are quickly growing. Um, so there are, you can either look on psychology today, there are some child life specialists um, who are on that platform, um, as well as going to the Child Life Association's website. Um, that's www.childlife.org. And there's a search engine there that you can um, kind of look for a specialist in your area to look for supports. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Sam, for sharing your wealth of knowledge with the IDF and SCID communities. Um, thank you so much to everyone as well for submitting your questions. I think those were some great ones. And um, again, we will be sharing the information that Samantha shared with us after the program. So feel free to circle back to that if you have further questions. Um, thank you so much again, Sam. This was wonderful. Uh, if you have additional questions or just want to know more about um, Kids Coat Baltimore, feel free to check out their Instagram page. We have their handle right there. Um, and also, Sam, let us know they have a new website in the works. So we'll be sure to share that with you all um, when that is when that has made its debut. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, if anyone has additional questions, they can be sure to ask IDF. Um, go online and submit your questions to ask IDF at www.primaryimmune.org slash ask IDF, or feel free to give us a call at the number on your screen. Um, we hope that you will remember to take advantage of all of the resources that SCID Compass has to offer. This includes our brand new SCID and family planning worksheet. Um, you'll see that on your left there. And this is designed to help parents think through the different plan family planning options and special considerations after having a child with SCID. Um, we also want to highlight our new provider fact sheet on the right, um, which informs doctors about SCID and provides them with guidelines on how to communicate a diagnosis to a family all very relevant to our topic today. Mm -hmm. um, before we close, we want to remind you that all IDF programming is guided by the individuals and families that we serve. Many of the topics we explore through Skid Compass are applicable to the PI community and rare disease in general, and all are welcome to learn with us throughout this event series. Please take a moment to scan the code on your screen and take our very brief program evaluation survey. The survey will also be emailed out to everyone after the program. Lastly, we hope you will join us next week for the next Skid Compass Lunch and Learn on Wednesday, February 9th, where we take a look at three years in newborn screening for Skid in North Carolina with Scott Schoen, Lab Director at the North Carolina State Public Health Lab. 
Um, I think everyone will join us today in thanking you again, Samantha, for this wonderful presentation. We truly appreciate it. Um, thank you everyone who was able to join us for today's program, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you guys.